he has taught at MIT, Yale, uh, Rhode Island Institute of Rhode Island School of Design, and uh, Harvard University. Um, he has given seminars and exhibitions all over the United States, as well as exhibitions throughout the world of his work. Um, he has also been uh, a Loeb Fellow for Advanced Environmental Studies at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, um, and has distinguished himself uh, as one of the favorite renderers or illustrators of most of some of the top firms in the country. Uh, one in particular that comes to mind is the office of I.M. Pei, uh, which you may have seen recently completed a project, prominent project in the uh, Louvre uh, court in Paris. Um, one of his most recent projects uh, that Steve has been involved with is the founding uh, in 1986 of the American Society of Architectural per Perspectivists. And he may tell you a little bit about that. Um, he is also uh, a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Um, I've known Steve for several years now and of course, as you probably know, he's not at a loss for things to draw or how to draw them. I also have found out he's never been at a loss for words. And so I think you will really enjoy his talk tonight. Uh, Steve Olds. Okay. Okay. Sure. Does this work? Everybody hear me? Way up there? No? Yes. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to hold it because when I let it fall down and talk up here, it's difficult to hear me. Paul, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, overblown introduction. I do appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, we, I think I've never known you to be at a loss for words either. So there. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to get you good in a couple of minutes. But first, uh, I do want to say something about my baby, my recent baby, which is the American Society of Architectural Perspectivists that Paul mentioned or ASAP for short, because that's what every client always mentions as the schedule for uh, work that we're required to do. Uh, we have currently about 300 uh, members nationwide and in Canada. And we have a yearly competition and exhibition, which results in a catalog, this being the first, this being the last graduated color here, and uh, the most recent, <clears throat> which is the fourth year, uh, will be on view at the Art Institute in Chicago, which is just up the road. Uh, the fifth, the evening of the sixth of October, which is about three weeks from now. So. Any of you would like to see architectural drawing work, which is the creme de creme for this year, out of approximately 600 submissions, there were 59 pieces chosen for the, uh, for the show. Six from Canada, one from Mexico, the rest from all over the country. I think Indiana is even represented, by golly. Uh, you could see me after class, as they say, and I'll give you the details. <clears throat> anyway, I, I would like to say that we do give a prize, a big, very highly prestigious prize. No money, I'm sorry, but a lot of prestige called the uh, 
Hugh Ferris Memorial Prize. Some of you kids may have heard of Hugh Ferris. I certainly hope so. Uh, won by <clears throat> last year watercolors by the name of Tom Schaller, whose work is shown here and who will also be exhibiting in Chicago. Uh, the current winner is another academician from Penn State, some other college somewhere else out there in the east. But I do hope that you can come up and see some of its really uh, very good work. I'm, <clears throat> as every speaker you will ever hear probably tells you, very pleased to be here, to be in Indiana. And I actually do mean it, uh, because every architect should obviously sometime in his life see the Taj Mahal, should see Orangeham, and should see Columbus, Indiana. I do know people who have driven for hours and hours and hours to Columbus, Ohio, to find that there is a distinction. <laughs> Happily, I was in the hands of a very capable guide. Paul Lasseau is certainly nothing if not a capable guide, and he's considerably more than that. I do appreciate your patience and your wisdom and the insights and all that good stuff. Uh, what did occur to me is that uh, <clears throat> there are a number of remarkable parallels between Paul and myself. It did occur to me, for instance, that we share a first name, although my handle is, is Steve, anybody who knows me, and this includes everybody here after we go through this tonight. Uh, my official name is Paul, and uh, we share that. I just sort of started making a list, realized that we share a whole lot of other things as well. I don't know whether you've thought about this. Probably not. You've got more important things to think about. But uh, neither of us is too tall. Neither of us is too thin. And neither of us is too young. <laughs> uh, we have both lived in New Mexico. We both married ladies from Queens, New York. We have both published all of our books with Van Oster and Reinhold and suffered through some of the same editors. And if you really want to come down to it, if somebody says Paul Lasso and Paul Lassols, it's really not that far apart. So I don't need to be here at all because you're here all the time. You didn't realize that we were clones, did you? All right, end of embarrassment. Thanks anyway. I do appreciate your, your uh, help so far. I was not trained as an artist. I was trained as an architect and therefore have contracted the disease terminally. I am an architect. I cannot get the hat off. I don't want to get it off. Uh, so my point of departure about drawing is as an architect, always has been. Drawing, as I see it, is subservient to or is in service to uh, architecture. The important dimension to me is the third dimension, not the second. So by doing representational work in two dimensions, uh, it's always the three-dimensional that I have in mind. I also am not interested, I was not interested Actually, I wasn't even interested in drawing as a separate or single pursuit as a young developing architect 412 years ago. Uh, but it just sort of happened that as a Texas Tech graduate and a transplant to the big bad wicked east where Walter Gropius was holding sway, Gropius was my first employer, uh, that nobody could draw, for reasons I think probably most of you understand, that the, uh, the, the Beaux-Arts, which had held sway for a hundred or more years, was displaced by the Bauhaus, and at that point, on the East Coast anyway, all of the uh, 
casts and busts were thrown out and nobody drew except in the closet. Nobody was taught to draw and therefore after a couple of decades nobody could draw. And being a transplant from a place that the Bauhaus wave had not yet hit, the middle of the, the good solid middle of the country, by gosh, uh, I was a little strange in that I could draw and so therefore I kept getting tapped on the shoulder at places like TAC and Cambridge 7, which were my first two, two uh, firms of employment, to do drawing. And in this environment, I begin to feel that, well, if I'm doing this stuff, I may as well investigate it, figure out what works, what doesn't. I'm pragmatic, if nothing else. And uh, determined that I would not work in color typically. I would not work in wet medium, typically. I would work in the simple, democratic, inexpensive, forgiving media of pencil and more specifically wax-based pencil. So that's what I've spent the last 25 years uh, developing, ways to put it down and ways to, yes, Virginia, take it up. When not only I make a mistake, but when an architect whether I'm that architect or another person is, changes his or her mind, which is, happens with some frequency. As a matter of fact, if one believes, as I do, that drawing is most useful as an investigative tool, being able to modify or tinker with or tweak or change a drawing is at least as important as being able to, to put it down well. Now, the title of this talk is Drawing the Future, which happens to be an advertisement for my latest book, which is available at fine bookstores everywhere, ho, ho, ho. Actually, that's not quite true, but if you, uh, again, see me afterwards, I have this one copy I'll sell to anybody who wants it. <clears throat> and I'll write anything you want me to in it. I'm easy. I mean, I'm really easy. Uh, I'd like to make a little bit of a distinction between what drawing the future is and is not. In English, they talk about, two, uh, about three tenses, the past, present, and future. And I think to some extent, in drawing, we could talk about two tenses. The past and the present more or less could be lumped together because uh, if something has been built in the past and still exists in the present, then the distinction is relatively uh, uh, moot. Past, the drawing of past, you could say, that has disappeared, that is time removed, is a conceptual drawing type, which we might label retrospective <clears throat> drawing of the present, which includes that work in the past, which still is extant, is a perceptual drawing type, which means that it's inspective. One looks at something and makes a drawing of it, as Paul, the other Paul, does so well in sketches. But what we're talking about, and what I'd like to show you 80 only slides of tonight, is prospective drawing. Drawing the future, drawing of something which does not yet exist. Because as I recently read in the foreword in my own book, and it looked like it had a lot of authority when you read your own stuff, you know, in your own book, but you've forgotten you said it, and you read it and you think, my God, that sounds powerful. I, I almost have to apologize that I'll, uh, that I'll quote from my own preface my own uh, introduction tonight, but uh, <clears throat> the quotation that I saw is, the future, it could be argued, is the true medium of the designer. The designer really is, in a sense, a professional determiner of the future. And to work effectively with any medium, any visual medium, 
it's necessary to be able to see it <clears throat> with clarity, with precision, and to be able to manipulate it and understand what the implications of the manipulations are. That is the design process. Obviously, there are other means. I build models. I, as an architect, I, we do use models in our office. There are certain kinds of, of uh, problems that are best addressable with models or even with two-dimensional <coughs> uh, two dimensional models such as furniture cutouts uh, investing, uh, that is investigating uh, uh, room furniture arrangement in rooms, that kind of thing. That is something which, as Paul and I have discussed, is directly transferable to, to con computer uh, application, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about in a few minutes. So what we're going to take a look at is efforts that I have made usually on commission from other offices, other architects, most notably uh, IMP and partners, uh, efforts I have made to look into the future of the designed environment and come up with an image which is verifiable by photography. In other words, Although I don't believe the photorealistic image to be the only way of representing or investigating or suggesting the future, <clears throat> I do think that it's not a bad way because virtually everybody in this culture is photo literate, video literate, as it were. And so if one wants to communicate an architect's intention, be it your own or someone else's, in the design effort, uh, to be able to make a photorealistic uh, illustration of what that intention is, is very useful. And I've spent a lot of my career to date uh, attempting to do that and have in many cases gone back and verified, tested with, uh, with photography. I think... There are a couple of other things that I'm going to say as we go, but why don't we start looking at the slides, if we could have the lights. And uh, I'd like to just say that <clears throat> of the 80 slides that we'll be taking a look at, the first 20 are from quite a while back. That is, they are... Uh, They are from the late 60s and early 70s, and all from IMPA's office. Many of them will have to do with the National Gallery East Building. The middle 40 are uh, comprised of kind of a, a mis, uh, miscellaneous group of some commission work and some of my own architectural work, which I have illustrated. It's a slightly different. Uh, uh, different task to illustrate one's own work. I think it's important to continue practicing as an architect so that I don't just become somebody else's hired gun, but that I understand and keep fresh that link between my own uh, design efforts and illustration efforts. <coughs> and the last 20 will be two pay projects, the Dallas Symphony Hall or the Morton Meyerson Symphony Hall and the Louvre project, both of which involved rather extensively the use of computers. So the first 60 are hand, uh, typically hand generated, and the last 20 will involve computer use. Uh, the jacket of my book shows the uh, exterior view of the East building, which was drawn in 1971. The, the slide that will follow is the photograph, which is on the back jacket, which some of you may have noticed, is a photograph taken by me in 1978. Uh, it was very difficult to, to 
find a corresponding uh, sky because there are usually clouds in Washington. Uh, what was even more difficult, you could say, is to find a corresponding car, which, uh, let's see, yep, there it is, which uh, actually if you consider how the photograph was taken, you would realize that I simply waited with the, with the camera on the tripod until a car happened to go across 4th Street and was in that position before I clicked the shutter. There were several things that you might say that I did not anticipate. One is this little area of lightness, which, again, if one looks back, we can look back. The trees were in the way, so I was really sort of uh, saved on that one. Uh, another, I guess you could say, problem was the fact that this sculpture changed because the sculptor died. That was a rather severe uh, <clears throat> dislocation. But, uh, let's see, we've got to point this thing. So we have a, we have a Henry Moore uh, called Mirror, something like Mirror Edge Two-Piece, but it's affectionately known in the office as the Golden Molar. Uh, <laughs> anyway, you get the idea of, of what this drawing and photograph comparison is going to be. There are about seven or eight or maybe nine of these that you'll see uh, at, at different times in the, uh, in the slide sequence. Uh, what I'd like to do is show another kind of sequence now dealing with the interior of that space. And this is a design developmental sequence which Just need one more hand here, and that would do it. Which uh, starts out with this 1969 drawing of the interior of the space. I'm sure most of you have seen this building, or at least seen photographs, which is uh, very different indeed from the uh, from the way it it eventually uh, uh, was designed. And it's these drawings, these seven or so drawings that I'll go through quickly, that show the process drawings during about six months of intensive design with Carter Brown, the client, and I am, and the four or five other people on the design team to look at options, to look at spatial options. Uh, of this very difficult to perceive interior space. Triangular spaces are extremely difficult to sort of know what's happening behind your back, especially. Uh, in this situation, we're uh, showing the eating away of the, of the uh, ceiling. And in this slightly later view, we're showing even more of the ceiling eaten away. And this was very shortly after I am decided that the uh, uh, ceiling should go entirely and we should have nothing but a space frame. Then the question of what kind of space frame was addressed in later drawings, <clears throat> which lead to uh, a more familiar view that we uh, that reflect the final uh, the final version. I keep pointing this to the wrong place. Another pay project is the Wilson Commons uh, uh, Student Center at the University of Rochester. This is an early view looking toward the main building on the campus. Uh, a later view from the same viewpoint is here. You'll notice that there is a photographer right there taking the picture that you'll see at the next slide which is containing <clears throat> a photographer which is taking the picture that you just saw. And strangely enough, in the photograph, the photographer is there. Yes, it is a plant. It was a friend of mine. 
uh, I did not wait for somebody to just happen to that point and to take a picture. <clears throat> I'm not going to dwell on the comparison between the drawing and the, uh, and the photograph here because there are so many errors. I made so many mistakes on this that it's really very embarrassing. So moving along. <clears throat> Moving right along, another uh, early 70s building, this is 72, was the New England Aquarium of uh, Cambridge Seven Associates, which, in which I showed a sort of a general sprinkling of scale figures. I had no idea how popular the seal exhibition would be. Uh, <clears throat> also, I, I showed the flagpoles as being 30 feet, which uh, they have been originally shown the working drawings at that point as being 25 feet, and Peter Tremayeff, the client at Cambridge 7 with whom I was working, said those flagpoles are too short. I said, you're right, Peter, they really ought to be taller. He says, make them 30 feet. So I, I did, and he, he looked at it and he said, yeah, that's, that's much better. <clears throat> But then, of course, when the things were built, they were 25 feet again. So they never, that never got translated to the working drawings. It's one thing for the decision to be made on the basis of the investigative drawing, but it's got to be entered, as they say. The uh, building here is probably familiar to most of you. It's the Javits uh, Convention Center in New York, also designed by I.M. Pei and partners, actually Jim Freed, partner in charge, showing the sort of uh, inverted or reverse reading image of midtown Manhattan in the mirror surface <clears throat> of the building in a not very good, uh, uh, not very highly corresponding view, this uh, actual as-built photograph shows that the images that were reflected were really not nearly as precise as the ones that I had shown. The ones that I had shown required expensive glazing, and expensive glazing was not to be had on this uh, city-funded project. Uh, this is the, uh, an interior view of that space, which was done in 1980 without the benefit of a computer. Uh, I actually had at least one of my two assistants uh, seek psychiatric and visual help after this. <clears throat> we, we did it with old-fashioned means, pin registration and multicolored pencil layout, and uh, it was uh, quite a task. But this kind of thing you cannot fake as, uh, as you might fake the overlap of, of many trees or something like that. Obviously trees get darker against the sky as, they, as you see them overlapping each other. And all, that's about all you have to know. You can make them generally darker. But uh, with space frames, everything, every member is known. Every placement of every member is predictable. And the darknesses occur uh, in a very specific way. So we did this drawing at approximately 24 inches square, and here it's blown up to 8 feet square for exhibition in the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, the not, again, not too carefully corresponding version of this was taken on opening day in 1986 showing something that architects almost never like to admit, and that is that by the time you glaze these graceful and light and airy structures, <clears throat> they get a lot heavier, and they get a lot darker. And when I suggest that to people with whom I'm working, they say, well, we, we know it gets darker, and we know it gets heavier, but we don't want to show it that way. So what do you do? One can lead a horse, I guess, to water. The 
character of the building changes considerably at night when the greater source of light is on the inside and it becomes invisible and the insides become what you see. Again, this is, this is a retro colored print blown up to approximately six feet across for exhibition at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in early 1980. Uh, another night view is an ill-fated version of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, near the Washington Monument. Uh, this was designed by George Nodder and company, and later on the project was given to I.M. Pei and again Jim Freed, who designed the building that's currently going up. I did that drawing too, but it was too late to get uh, in the book. This was uh, uh, a night view of that earlier, uh, the earlier version. Another night view is from Minnesota, uh, I think St. Paul. This was in 1976, the Terra Texture, Texture competition showing a subterranean development in front of the Cass Gilbert uh, Capitol building. The, reason we chose a night view on this was to show a value drawing of a subterranean space got very depressing if it gets darker and darker as it gets deeper and deeper. So we thought by turning it around and showing it at night, uh, we could concentrate the visual interest where the new design was taking place and uh, do it with more and more white pencil on a blackboard. Another night view is the JFK 2000 uh, scheme for handling customs and immigration at uh, John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. The existing ring or necklace of uh, terminals surrounds a uh, a huge new facility that may or may not be built by the year 2000. It's currently under design uh, at Pay's office. Uh, a drawing which I guess contains all of the elements of the kind of work that I like to do in it was this very early <clears throat> 1964 competition drawing of a theater, a hypothetical theater done for the Roach uh, scholarship competition, which was unsuccessful in that. It was a runner-up, but it did win a national prize sponsored by the New York Architectural League. Uh, this is basically almost directly derivative of the so-called Minnesota School, which is the uh, LBDS, Light Building Dark Sky, coupling. <clears throat> I don't know whether you've Try dark skies, but try it, you'll like it. Uh, does some nice things. Uh, I initiate a string of my own work with that. This is a, to show to Paul and others in the audience that I don't always work with tone and I don't always work from eye level. This is a line drawing of an apartment that, uh, studio apartment that I did for my mother in New York. Uh, the way that turned out, in fact, was like that. I didn't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, <laughs> a house for a client at, uh, in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, is this, I guess looking at it now, very predictably mid-70s uh, mono pitch with a garage which gave the pitch the other way and, of course, was never built. but. The house was, anyway, nice sight on a river. And the interior did a trick which the owner wanted, and that was to make a house big on the inside and look small from the outside so that when the assessor passed in the street, uh, they'd be under-assessed. <clears throat> this was uh, facing south, and so <clears throat> it, it was prior to the oil crunch, but it was in fact, uh, a passive solar scheme, as you probably can see. A uh, competition done with another Boston area architect was for an 80-unit elderly housing scheme 
in Dracut, Massachusetts. This was one of the competition drawings which is on display in the other room. This was an eight and a half by 11. It took about eight hours or so to do that. Uh, the site unfortunately proved to be not viable, so we, after another site search, after looking at eight other sites, we came up with a cornfield with a bog and turned the bog into a pond, and this was the, uh, more or less, the final scheme, which was, in fact, happily, finally built, and according to post-occupancy evaluation, there are a lot of happy elderly people living here now. It only took five years to get that built, and those five years were the five very high inflation years of the late 70s, <clears throat> which mean, meant that we saw it go from brick to wood siding to vinyl siding, so we don't have any close-ups. Uh, <clears throat> but indeed, it was built. The next Four slides show how, uh, in many cases, it takes really two views <clears throat> to show a project completely. This is a, an IMPA project for Pitney, Bo Pitney Bowes headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut, from the seaside and from the land side. Quite a, a difference there. Also, this is, you may notice, is the opposite from the uh, Minnesota sky. This is the paper sky with the darker building, which saves a whole lot of time, as I'm sure all of you know. It's another thing about snow shots. I mean, you don't have to draw a foreground, right, if you've got snow. We'll get to that in a minute. Another pair, this for Washington, uh, Conklin and Rosant in New York are the architects, and uh, they figured that that a uh, uh, Arc de Triomphe was, if it's good enough for Paris, it's good enough for Washington, D.C. So this was an early proposal for the Naval Museum, uh, or the Naval Memorial, I should say, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Actually, some of the most effective uh, and useful drawings <clears throat> show with great clarity what not to do. And I think that was the case it could be argued, at least, that that was the case here, that the Fine Arts Commission saw immediately that this was not the thing to do. So the memorial took quite uh, a, a much less imposing uh, form eventually. Uh, this little sketch, uh, <clears throat> which involved about 700 person hours, is of the of Washington Cathedral. Uh, which you say, well, why not just take a photograph of it? <clears throat> well, the difficulty is that it, it only exists to this level, at least in 1981 when this was drawn. So the uh, two towers are shown here as added. The building is shown in its completed form. We also had to get rid of a couple of trees here, which they are not going to do for the photography. So they still use this image as the uh, definitive a uh, whole image of the west front of the flagship Episcopal Cathedral in this country. Some other tall buildings. This is uh, for Mexico City, an IMPE himself, not and partners, design uh, for the Reforma in Mexico City prior to the earthquake and prior to the oil crunch. This was never built, but something I understand from a Mexican colleague like it was built. Uh, another tall one, again, a photograph of this is in the exhibition, is Dallas Center, designed by Harry Cobb of I.M. Pei's office in 1977. I think this is, uh, I could talk about this drawing for at least 30 minutes, and if, if you were suffering through one of my classes, I would, but I'll just suffice it to say that the moiré, for instance, was not anticipated. It was simply a matter of very rigorously following the dictates of physics in the inner reflection of these two sides that generated these secondary phenomena. So <clears throat> as opposed to just sort of putting streaks across glass to suggest reflectivity, if you play by the rules, 
uh, you'll find that glazing, in fact, does look mysteriously reflective. Another Dallas building is the Arco Center with uh, Johnson's Thanksgiving uh, Place uh, Chapel in the foreground. That has a strange luminosity to me. I don't know exactly why. I think it's an error. I'll have to think about that one, but uh, does it look like it's illuminated from the inside, like it's actually translucent? It does to me. Hmm. Anyway, another Dallas building is uh, Fountain Place or Allied Bank, which was designed by Harry Cobb of I.M. Payne Partners, and the landscaping was done by Dan Kiley. Some wonderful fountain work in here. I would recommend a trip to Dallas if you don't have one in your agenda. Uh, the next view is a photograph taken more or less from the hip as a snapshot of that building. I didn't wait for the clouds in this one, but it uh, was reasonably accurate, although you may have noticed that with the drawing there was another building in back of it which was identical and turned at 90 degrees, although you could just see the edge of it, <clears throat> which due to the oil crunch was never, was never built and alas will never be built. Another reflective building is, uh, whoops, uh, let's see, try that, is this headquarters for uh, an airline in Argentina, which went bankrupt very shortly after the drawing was done. Uh, but in order to show this as being very reflective, <clears throat> it was necessary to put something in the sky. I figured clouds were something that wouldn't cause too much problem, so that you could see that this was not just a matte surface. Also, to give a sense of location, the this corner of this building is reflected, uh, or that is the opposite corner, is reflected in here, so one gets a sense of the context, the location uh, of the building. I am said to me on this project, make it as shiny as a new car. So I sat down and started looking at uh, brochures from car companies and uh, did my best. Another semi-reflective IMPA building is the Media Arts and Technology Building, or now called the Wiesner Building at MIT, uh, which mercifully had this strange enigmatic piece <clears throat> adjacent to the semi-reflective surface so that one could see that it indeed was uh, reflective. The building is constructed more or less along these lines, but I don't have a, uh, I don't have a photograph of that right now. A little bit of a color sampler just to suggest that I do know how to use other Prismacolors than the 935, or at least that I have attempted to use them. Uh, this hospital in Bethesda, Maryland, shows a device which I more or less observed on my own and have written about in my first book called Deflection, which is the characteristic of a reflective surface to uh, put an area of lightness, coherent geometric lightness, on uh, adjacent matte surfaces. So you see the deflection here from that surface, and you see the reflection of that deflection. Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Hello. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, right here. So the argument that I use this, this drawing for is to, uh, to indicate that things which may seem academic, observations which may seem like they have no application, do in some cases have a very uh, 
useful application. In this case, one couldn't necessarily tell how far this uh, object, the new object, was from the old if it weren't for the interaction of those shadows and counter shadows, as it were. A Caesar Pelly uh, project in Cleveland, the Cleveland Clinic, which uses reflection to show um, the only context really uh, available aside from this existing little building. And this is uh, a building which you can't even show, uh, see, but you know is right there, uh, done in 1981. This poster-like, very intense color, very large scale original is not even a perspective at all. It's an oblique drawing, computer generated drawing of a tower by pay going up in Los Angeles right now called obviously Library Square. Uh, there's some stories, I don't have time to tell about this, but suffice it to say that the, uh, the, the poster reproduced well and worked well, not our usual kind of drawing. Uh, this is done for Pietro Belusky in uh, uh, as a complex of towers in Miami, again, uh, a color, just a suggestion of how color can be used. And this is not a commissioned building. This was simply uh, uh, what I refer to as a super cube, which was uh, done as a piece in my first book to indicate uh, dramatic elements and also scale devices. <clears throat> cube 60 stories on a side. This indeed was a real building and is completed in 1983. This drawing was done in 1979. Uh, Portland, Maine, I am Pei and Partners, uh, the Museum of, uh, the Portland Museum of Art. Um, there is a photograph which follows this which shows that there is a tremendous, there are a tremendous number of elements that I did not include in this drawing, but I think you'll probably concur that I should not have. And that's the street furniture. I really think it could hardly have been more unfortunate to have some of these things located where they happen to be located. <clears throat> so I think it does raise that question of, of what should be included in a photographic representation uh, of, a, of a building like this. Again, a photograph of this is in the exhibition. This is the uh, section perspective of that building, which shows nothing but light, structure, and space with three scale figures to let you know what size things are. I happen to love section perspectives. This is one I did of a house uh, for a client uh, on Cape Cod and for a house for another client in Schenectady, New York, showing exterior lighting as being as if on an overcast day. No hard light, but showing the quality of soft light that's coming in from the, uh, from the windows. That's the exterior. And this is the house as it was constructed. Uh, the New England sun box, obviously after the salt box, was a competition for an energy efficient house, uh, which was a regional competition, about 145 entries, three of which were selected for construction. This was, this was one of them. As I mentioned earlier, using snow in the foreground just means that if you're in a big hurry, you don't have to draw anything. And you also don't have to draw anything on the roof. It's all paper. Uh, the first of these that was built was in Methuen, Massachusetts. There are about 16 or so of these constructed now. And other 
competition drawings are this interior showing the quality of light inside the dining room, which is beyond the sun space. And although it was not precisely a corresponding photograph, this is, uh, was taken professionally and uh, shows approximately that view. And again, the sun space itself showing some of the reflectivity in the glass of the sliding doors uh, is shown here. This was actually an image very similar to one used on the cover of uh, Better Homes and Gardens in October of 85, which leads us to the last 20 slides, which uh, have to do with two projects. One is the Dallas Symphony, which I just mentioned. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how the computer was used here. I'll simply say that this work was all done <clears throat> at Computer Vision Inc. headquarters in Bedford, Massachusetts in the middle of the night when nobody else was using the equipment. Uh, the Computer Vision system, which was a, a now an old-fashioned mainframe workstation kind of system, uh, had a, a nine-part screen which uh, allowed one to deal with a number of three-dimensional images, whether isometric, elevation, plan, or perspective, simultaneously. It was very nice to be able to change anything in any of those views and have it be changed in all the others. Uh, the definitive view turns out to be this one, which is shown full screen here. And of course, the, the different colors indicate different layers of, uh, uh, of information, which would be analogous to <clears throat> overlays uh, of, say, yellow trace so that one can treat the layer of green all at the same time or the layer of red all at the same time. Also, if you make an error, you haven't blown the whole thing, you've just blown the whole layer. So there's, uh, it makes it a little more forgiving. Uh, the, the plotter generated print of this with sort of one level of fill is shown here with uh, uh, to, to just get rid of some of the ambiguity of the non-hidden lines, which uh, were not removed. I am a great believer that the hidden lines typically should not be removed, maybe suppressed, or if there are too many of them, maybe some of them removed, but uh, they're very useful to a designer. They may not be useful to somebody who's looking for a representational picture, but I think that uh, drawings with most of the hidden lines typically are richer than those which, in which they've all been removed. This view was uh, turned into a drawing incomplete. You can see that I haven't finished this. This was sort of thrown away as it got to this point. Uh, showing the daytime version of this space, and we realized I am realized at that point, and this is about 83, six years ago, uh, realized that there was so much brightness outside that the way to show nuance of lighting and inside the space was to take a night view. So in fact, I went back to the drawing board, took this night view, which shows the two onyx uh, uh, lighting fixtures, which according to the New York Times on Friday had not yet arrived. This, uh, <clears throat> this drawing of the future uh, had come to fruition. The, the future it represents came to fruition apparently last Friday night with the first concert being heard uh, in this hall. The exterior, uh, which is an earlier version than was built, a uh, more expansive version, is shown here in a daytime view and here <clears throat> in a night view. And another night view, this time 
drawn entirely by the computer is of a project that will need, I suppose, no introduction, the Pay Pyramid and Grand Louvre expansion of uh, the Louvre Museum in Paris. Uh, we were very lucky in this particular representational shot to, <clears throat> to get a, a, a very striking and realistic view, which is somehow easier to do, I think, with twilight or evening night views with a computer than it is with daytime views. That's something we're going to talk about later. But the hand drawings that accompanied this work is my drawing white pencil on blackboard uh, <clears throat> with wet pavement in a Parisian misty night uh, showing the, uh, the fountains and the glazed pyramids, little and big, lighted from below, which was published everywhere. This was in Time Magazine and New York Times and all over the Paris newspapers. And one corresponding view of this done in the daytime, which never was published anywhere. Oops. Sorry, I guess it got cut. Uh, because it showed the pyramid in such a way that it could have been perceived to be opaque. And that is something that I and Pei realized if it ever got around that it was just an opaque pyramid that it would be almost impossible to, uh, to correct. These five slides are of the... Uh, of a sequence at eye level looking at the pyramid from a continuum, a pedestrian's eye walk from left to right to reassure the French that this was not going to be that overpowering. Uh, got to remember that it didn't exist at the time and the French were extremely skeptical as I'm sure you could understand or could know if you, if any of you has ever known a single Frenchman, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lousseau. Uh, anyway, moving from left to right, and this could be done, of course, in much smaller increments. It could be done as a movie, and this is one of the things that the computer is very good at allowing. Once the database is established, you can generate as many of these images as you want to very, very easily. Uh, you get some kind of sense, a fourth dimensional sense, sense of time, of what happens as you change station points. The computer, I would say, was used not only to illustrate the form, the final form decided on, but it was also used to investigate what height and base and slope the pyramid was to take. So it was definitely used as an instrument of investigation as well as illustration. This view is my favorite uh, it was also IM's favorite to some extent because it hid part of the pyramid and in effect minimized it without telling a lie. It just simply told maybe less of the truth. Uh, so the version that I drew, which was on the cover of, the, of my second book, is shown here. And <clears throat> in a photograph which is... Uh, which was taken only about a month and a half ago, which is the last slide, shows the way this actually looks on the ground in Paris right now as the latest future to have been realized. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll take questions or whatever. questions anybody would like to ask. If, uh, if not, 
let the people who have to go to the bathroom leave, and uh, I'll just stay here for a few minutes, and if you'd like to come up to the front, we could do it uh, just one or two on one, if you'd like. Is that okay?